Welcome to Fringe Pop 321, the show that believes the world is stranger than we think, but thinking should not be strange. If you've watched Fringe Pop before, or if you're into esoteric religions and the history of occult thought, you know the woman in this picture. This is Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, 1831 through 1891. She is the co-founder of the Theosophical Society. We know her today as the matriarch of the New Age movement. In her time, she was a prolific writer, and she is mostly responsible for the thought of the theosophical religious system. Now, her beliefs are at the heart of the alternative history that is featured in shows today, like Ancient Aliens. Ideas like human evolution from advanced extraterrestrial races, or advanced ancient technology courtesy of the Atlanteans. Millions of people today see these ideas exactly the way Blavatsky intended, as an alternative to both traditional Judeo-Christianity and Darwin. She is steering a middle course, a religious philosophy that is contrary to scientific knowledge of the day, but also still kind of scientific, but isn't Christianity. And many people have never actually read her two major works, and that's understandable because they're both extremely long. Isis Unveiled is 1,300 pages, and The Secret Doctrine is over 1,400 pages. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the first of her works, Isis Unveiled, to see what it was that Blavatsky was saying in her time, and also what some of the shows that you know are saying in our time. Let's get a little feel for Isis Unveiled. The full title is Isis Unveiled, a master key to the mysteries of ancient and modern science and theology. It was published in 1877. And again, it's huge, over 1,300 pages. The subtitle actually says a lot. A master key to the mysteries of ancient and modern science and theology. The book was actually a reaction to the dominant materialistic worldview of the age, the late 18th and 19th centuries, when scientists were thinking, boy, we've pretty much solved everything now. It was the new era of geology, paleontology, biology, of course, with Darwin. Now, Blavatsky wrote that what she was trying to do was issue a plea for the recognition of the hermetic philosophy the anciently universal wisdom religion as the only possible key to the absolute in science and theology. So she's trying to address both science and religion, theology, in her work. This book, Isis Unveiled, is composed of two volumes. Volume one is an occultic perspective on science itself, attacking Darwin's origin of species and Thomas Huxley's Physical Basis of Matter. Volume two is an attack on the traditional interpretation of the Bible and giving preferential treatment to the more Gnostic interpretations of scripture. So she's bookending these two things, science and theology, two fundamental areas of knowledge and offering her own views and again, steering her own middle course. We're gonna take a closer look at each volume as we continue. Recall that Isis Unveiled, the first volume, is Blavatsky's occult perspective on science. Now what she's doing in this volume by virtue of the Vedas, which are Eastern religious texts, texts from ancient India, and other Hindu and Indian sources besides the Vedas that come from the same place, she's going to argue that psychic forces are the basis of physical reality. And this is gonna affect her take on things like physics. She's gonna take a positive view of alchemy. Paracelsus, for example, is elevated as an authority. What she's really angling for is lost knowledge, ancient wisdom from the East that she views as having explanatory power for 
all of science, all of reality. And she's going, to, she's going to argue that this has been lost by the West. The West has been blinded by things like Christianity and Judaism and even Islam. Now, her view, obviously, is also going to contradict Darwin's evolutionary model. And in its place, Blavatsky is going to argue for something called emanationist cosmology. It's kind of a fancy term for the idea that everything, all life, can be traced back to an emanation, an outflow from the divine through the spirit realm and finally into the physical realm. Now, if you're wondering, well, what, what is that? What, what does she mean by the divine and the spirit realm? Again, that can be pretty nebulous, pretty vague in Blavatsky. But what she's trying to do is argue that everything we know physically in our physical world actually not only has a spiritual source, but is made of spiritual stuff. She's going to deny the difference between the creator and creation. She is specifically what philosophers would call today a monist. Now, monism is the notion that all is one. Again, we've heard people in pop culture that we would instantly recognize, like Oprah, say this kind of thing on her TV show. And I'm not saying that Oprah really knows where she's getting this. Uh, it's so ubiquitous that people aren't really familiar with the sources. But that's what Blavatsky was saying, all is one. Everything we know comes from some sort of divine spiritual substance, whatever that is. And we are included in that. We are a result of that. We have a spark of the divine within us, and so does everything else. No creator is therefore necessary. And if you think about it, if you dispense with a creator, you dispense with accountability to that creator, to that God. So this is where Blavatsky was headed. She's trying to reject the Western blinding, in her view, by Ju Judaism and Christianity, book religions, and also steering a course away from Darwiz Darwinism. Her middle course solution is this notion of monism, that all is one and everything comes from one ethereal, undefinable, unknowable source that's just out there. If we think about it, we don't really have to go too far to realize that that is quite influential for today in terms of what we call the New Age movement. Any system, again, that rejects traditional theology or Darwin itself is going to land where Blavatsky landed. Now, the first volume of Isis Unveiled was about science. The second volume of this work is entitled Theology. And this basically continues Blavatsky's polemic rant, really, against Christianity, as well as her thesis of a common ancestor of the religions of the world. Theology, this volume, is replete with comparisons of Christianity with Hinduism and Buddhism, for instance, which favors, of course, Eastern religions. Now, Blavatsky argued that the church had fundamentally misunderstood the Bible, and of course she is the one that's correctly understood it. Uh, very common, again, for people who are idiosyncratic like this in their doctrine to make such claims, and Blavatsky was no exception. She also makes arguments that are similar to what we would now call Jesus mythicism. That is the idea that, well, there really was never a Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus is really sort of a Christianization of pagan deities from elsewhere in the ancient world. Jesus' mythicists, in fact, owe a debt to Blavatsky because she was there before they were. She also takes Gnostic approaches to Christianity, specifically the New Testament, although her thinking here is somewhat primitive because she lived in an era before the discovery of the Nag Hammadi texts which are fundamental to the articulation of Gnosticism in its ancient context. Blavatsky further argued that the doctrines of Buddhism were parodied by Christianity. She argued that the Book of Job derived from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And if you've ever read both of those things, you might wonder, where in the world did she get that? How in the world could she even be making these connections? She also argued that the patriarchs were unhistorical, the 12 sons of Jacob. They were actually the signs of the zodiac. 
Now, as you listen to all this, you would wonder, where in the world is she getting all of this? If you watched our previous episode on Blavatsky's life, you know the answer. She's getting it from her ascended masters. Well, we're back to ascended masters. You can think of Dr. Strange and you get the idea. Ancient adepts from the heights of the Himalayas in Tibet. In our previous episode of Blavatsky's life, we noted that she claimed to be in contact with certain individuals mentally, that she referred to as these ascended masters. Basically, what she's doing, what she's claiming, what she's describing is channeling. That would be the more familiar term today. So Blavatsky is actually claiming to be channeling information that goes into her books that give her her doctrine, her theology, and of course her beliefs about science. In the process of writing Isis Unveiled, Blavatsky's theosophical co-founder, Henry Olcott, occasionally observed what he called a wonderful psychophysiological change in her. She would go into a trance or be otherwise physically affected. Olcott went on to say that Blavatsky had become aware of the presence of another being inside her, writing and speaking through her, often describing scenes and subjects of which she had no knowledge personally. Olcott also records how even Blavatsky's handwriting could vary in style, a phenomenon which he attributed to her coming under the inspiration of various masters. Again, this is the sort of thing that we would call channeling or perhaps even possession today. Blavatsky cited approximately 1400 works in her book. Olcott claimed though that many of these references were drawn from invisible books. Yes, invisible books through Blavatsky's clairvoyant powers. Again, what she's seeing in her head or in her spirit or something like that. I would say though that there's probably a better explanation for her sources and her material. William Emmett Coleman's study of her writings detected over 2,000 instances of plagiarism of other sources. Coleman was an ardent spiritualist, so he wasn't a traditional Christian at all. He was a spiritualist, which is a system that Blavatsky was rejecting in favor of her own theosophical doctrine. And Coleman was a clerk in the U.S. Army Quartermaster's office in Fort Leavenworth in the 1870s, and then later in San Francisco. He had plenty of interaction with Blavatsky's material, and he wrote in his study, quote, there is not a single dogma or tenet in theosophy, nor any detail of moment in the multiplex and complex concatenation of alleged revelations of occult truth in the teachings of Madame Blavatsky and the pretended adepts, the source of which cannot be pointed out in the world's literature. From first to last, their writings are dominated by a duplex plagiarism, plagiarism in idea and plagiarism in language. So was Blavatsky possessed by some spiritual entity or just a plagiarist? Well, honestly, neither speaks very well. At best, her material is purely speculative. No one has ever discovered these ancient channeled sources, these books that her ascended masters supposedly exposed her to and helped her translate again in her thoughts. Speculation really is not a good basis for a worldview. And at the end of the day, that's really what you have with Blavatsky's writings. Speculation put forth as worldview, as truth. Not a good idea. Thanks for watching this episode of Fringe Pop 321. Please visit our website for this episode and other episodes to get more material, get access to resources about our subjects. And again, please keep watching because what you know may not be so.